Thank you. So good morning, colleagues. I'm Marie Werung from the Office of Organizational and Professional Development, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 Town Hall meeting with President Lebron. We've had a lot happening around campus since we last convened. We've got new buildings, we've got new programs, new leaders, a new job structure and pay structure, a new talent development strategy and careers at Rice. And today, we're excited to share a progress report on the V2C2, on the impact of Rice people and initiatives outside the hedges, on the state of the university, and on the accomplishments of our Rice people right here in our community, including those of our soon to be revealed Gillis Award recipient. So this marks the 13th year of town hall meetings, and I'd like to thank President Lebron for his continued support for and his presence at these events. So please silence your mobile devices. We have microphones set up in two areas, so be thinking of your questions uh, for once the president concludes his remarks and plan to come to one of the mics to uh, ask your question. And uh, sit back and help me welcome President Lebron. I think I'm going to start with two apologies. Uh, one, I'm going to apologize for the weather. And I need to do that because when it gets beautiful and warm, I'm going to take credit for the weather. Uh, and I, I don't know about all of you, but when I moved here now almost 15 years ago, I was promised it never got below 65 degrees. And, and, and so I'm going to have to talk to the board about that. The, the other thing I want to apologize, I'm just curious, um, how many of you follow me on Instagram? How many follow me on Twitter? That's a small number, but I wanted to apologize for my Instagram posting yesterday, and you all remind me of this. So uh, Ping and I were at the rodeo for Rice Day at the rodeo, and in addition to sort of riding in, you know, sort of the grand parade, which I consider one of the most dangerous things that I do each year. <laughs> I'm serious, the horses are like bumping into each other, and, and my horse toward the end apparently decided it was tired of, of just parading around and decided to get a little feisty. But then, also last night, uh, we started the calf scramble. Do you all know what a calf scramble is? You know, yeah, so, so it started, you know, so I took off my hat and then I have to drop the hat. And, and then all these young people start running and grabbing the calves. And I got a video at the very end of this one poor girl struggling to get her calf across the line. And I tweet, I, I, this, I'm sorry, this is Instagram, and I, I posted the video and said, some days feel like this. <laughs> and I come into this room and I think, no, they don't, because all of you are just working hard all the time to get all those calves across the line. And I just wanted to begin by thanking all of you for doing that every single day. So, I'm going to start. Um, uh, really, I think it's good for us to constantly remind ourselves what we're about. And we have lots of different ways. Uh, and lately, we've been boiling it down to, to three things around which we ought to really organize our thoughts about what we each contribute to the university. They're the excellence of what we do and everything we do across here, the opportunity that we provide for our students, our faculty, for our staff to grow and contribute, and the impact on our world. That's really what we're about. It's about what our strategic plan is about, is excellence, opportunity, and impact. Our mission, once more to remind ourselves, our distinctive, as a research university with a distinctive commitment to undergraduate education, we aspire to path-breaking research, unsurpassed teaching, and contributions to the betterment of our world. We seek to fulfill this mission by cultivating a diverse community of learning and discovery that produces leaders across the spectrum of human endeavor. And then I think, very importantly, our values, which once more, were formulated so that I and you could remember them. I think what's most distinctive about this statement of values is not merely that it spells our name, 
but it explicitly includes the notion of taking responsibility for those values. Lots of universities have great statements of values, but it's the sense that each of us takes with us that we have responsibility for living up to those values and doing what we can to make our institution, or institution lives up to those values. Many things going on, examples of those values that I'll talk about later, the Rice investment, really taking a step forward, updating our policy on sexual misconduct, particularly sexual harassment, our response to Hurricane Harvey, which now is a year and a half away, and our constant support for all members of our community and think, keeping in mind those who are particularly vulnerable in the fight, this is particularly included uh, our immigrants and DACA students. Our staff, we want to recognize in all the different ways that we can, the Rice Mile Award for outstanding performance and service. I want to thank all of you who are listed here. Uh, really, just every year, we have this incredible number of people who are going above and beyond. Our uh, Board of Trustees at each meeting recognizes an outstanding member of the staff or even a group. Most recently, we had the entire staff of the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen, which really has had a tremendous impact on our students here. And then we want to really single out one person, and uh, this is named for Elizabeth Gillis, who's here with us, and her remarkable contributions. Uh, we established this award to annually recognize the outstanding achievements and services by a staff member in support of the mission of the university. Recipient shall, like the woman for whom the award is named, show consistently outstanding performance and embody an exceptional attitude of service. Did you want to join me, Elizabeth? And so, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Elizabeth Gillis Award, Matt Taylor. So this is just, this is a few minutes, and you have to listen to all of the good things that were said about you. And I have to say that this is not in here, but I met Matt shortly after we arrived when he was a resident associate at Brown College, so it was a long time ago. 25 years. 25 years, right. Dr. Matt Taylor has been at Rice collectively for 24 years. And through these years, has held several positions across campus, including lecturer in the history department, assistant director of admissions, program director of leadership rice, assistant dean of undergraduates, advisor to the dean of undergraduates, and finally associate vice provost. Through his tenure at rice, Matt has spearheaded or participated in numerous high impact university programs and initiatives. Many of these were undertaken in addition to his regular duties in the departments in which he worked. Through his leadership and his heavy lifting, Matt makes great things happen at Rice. He spearheaded both the program in writing and communication, and together with Professor Mike Wolf, Matt designed and managed the Rice Emerging Scholars Program that has helped incoming Rice undergrads succeed and graduate. These programs are fundamental to our student success. One nomination letter reflects a sentiment that best describes Matt's commitment to service and the university. Quote, any one of these accomplished projects would merit recognition of Matt as an invaluable member of Rice University. He exemplifies the qualities of innovativeness, creativity, collegiality, and extraordinary service. In addition to his incredible support to Rice programs and initiatives, he is also seen as a trusted advisor and confidant to many. The nomination letters came from both faculty and staff, spanning several areas on campus. 
When you spend time with Matt, you notice what a consistent presence he is on campus, especially for our students and staff. He supports what students care about, from attending a vigil to a softball game. Matt shows up. He never toots his own horn, but he routinely advocates for others who are excellent at their work. He's a team player, and we're very fortunate to have him on our team at Rice. Of the many letters received, one nomination summarizes it the best. I personally hope Matt wins this award so that his standard is held high for other staff at Rice to aspire, as he is appreciated for his earnest, humble efforts to serve Rice. Please join me in congratulating Matt Taylor. That is a truly, truly uh, well-deserved award by, by someone who never asks for any attention for, for what he does for our community. And I want to thank once more Elizabeth Gillis for, for making the trip to this cold city um, uh, to present the award. Uh, we also want to recognize those with uh, multiple years of, of service. 118 who've been here five years. And then we have, uh, let's see, 27. Any of those here? Those who have been here 25 years or more? 27 folks, hear their names. Why don't you stand if you are here? Don't be shy. <laughs> And then always one of the things we do always is take a, a moment to recognize those members of our community who have passed away within the past year. And returning to our values, our community is a central element of that. We live in somewhat challenging times in which parts of our community and the communities outside our community aren't always feeling as welcome as they should, and that responsibility falls on each of us every day, not only to build the diversity of our community, but to make sure that we're responsive to that diverse community, reaching out to each other, understanding the challenges that folks face, and then making sure that each of us in our own behaviors makes all people in our community feel included. Uh, we promised I would talk just briefly about the higher education uh, landscape. Um, I'm not sure why. Things at Rice are great, and in the rest of the world, maybe less so. Um, but we face challenges. I would say the public skepticism about universities continues, very different than it was a decade or two decades ago. Uh, we face the challenges and opportunities of new technologies and disruption of higher education. A lot of talk also about affordability and finances, and Rice, I'll come back to, took a very bold step in that direction. So we're on the sort of good side. I got an inquiry just yesterday from the, the press, which is writing a story about the great and terrible divide emerging in the United States, but heard about the Rice investment and wants to write about that as a counter example to what's going on in the United States. And then various challenges of government regulation in various directions. I think when it comes to higher education, it's really not that one party or the other party believes less in regulating higher education. They just regulate it differently. Changes in Title IX, our current policies uh, so far are not changing, we'll see challenges in immigration policy, which really affect our community in an incredibly broad way, from faculty members who may have difficulty uh, returning to students we're recruiting, to staff who may have to renew their status in some way. That's a constant challenge. 
And then just recently, the president announced he was interested in uh, taking a more aggressive approach to freedom of speech on college campuses. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about where we are in the, the V2C2, our strategic plan for uh, basically this decade. And it contains seven elements, down from 10 the last time. It's got various iterations that by now you should have some familiarity with. Each of them can be uh, captured in a few words. And just a few examples of, of where we're going, I think you heard uh, mentioned. Thanks again to, to Matt Taylor. Uh, if we want to really build a diverse community, we have to recognize the, the differences in, in opportunities that people have. And some of them come in with uh, really a school full of advantages and AP courses, and others really come in with a very different background. Some have succeeded in environments by, by working together with students, and so they're used to that environment, and some have succeeded by separating themselves out from the difficulties that other students have, have faced. I spoke uh, just the other day when Sal Khan was on campus about one freshman that I had met who uh, first came across Rice uh, through OpenStax and our AP course materials and developed an ambition to come to Rice and took a practice SAT exam and didn't do well. And so it looked like he couldn't come to Rice. And, but then the people administering the practice exam offered him and his family for $3,000. They would help him succeed on the SAT. And his single mother couldn't afford that. And so he went on line and took the con SAT prep course. And now he's a student here at Rice to, today. And those students, we need to do what we can to make sure they succeed at the maximum level. And that's really a focus, not just Matt, but a whole team of folks have really put their energies into how can we help all students succeed at Rice, particularly lower income students, first gen students. That begins really from the day they arrive on the campus through the orientation and O-Week programs, our advising programs, the rest programs, with the constant attention. And people sometimes ask, well, why do you need so many folks at a university who aren't faculty? And the simple answer to that question is because we are totally devoted to every student's success on this campus. It's reflected in our recent success on graduation rates and at 931 new students. We look at this over, over six years, 98% roughly returned the first year and most recently achieving a 95% six-year graduation rate. We're also building renowned graduate programs, and I like to remind folks, we're actually, we may be a comparatively small university, but we're actually a very balanced university between under, our undergraduate and graduate commitments. The figure I'd like to convey is if you put Rice into the Ivy League, we would be the median school in terms of the percentage of our students who are graduate students. In my experience with our undergraduates, they recognize very strongly that the success of the university they chose depends very much on the success of the graduate students within this university as well. These are just uh, US news ranking, I should say. There are other kinds of rankings out there. And Sarah Whiting sitting in the front row the uh, architecture graduate program, I think, ranks number seven. I got that memorized. Number, no, uh, number seven, uh, I was recently uh, visiting with the English department, which has received actually outstanding recognitions, both for undergraduate teaching, but also the placement of its graduate students in recent years, really in top tier, rare positions across the university in all schools, graduate and undergraduate. And here is one reflection over uh, from 2004 to, to last year, very significant increase, roughly speaking, uh, more than a 50% increase in doctoral degrees. And you'll see, despite the somewhat uh, lessening uh, interest by undergraduates in humanities majors, actually we've had a huge expansion in percentage terms in humanities doctoral students. Some of that is new programs and some of it's growing programs and success. 
And pursuant to the V2C2, we made a decision to at least try an experiment of creating a graduate college on campus. We're now in the sort of final stages of designing a new Sidrich College for undergraduates, and then we'll do some renovation to the Sidrich Tower and build a grad, well, and renovate it as a graduate college and see how that contributes to the sense of graduate community on our campus. We have to invest in faculty to achieve uh, preeminence. This is uh, Ruth Lopez Turley, who um, I'll say uh, th there's a lot of investment in Ruth Lopez Turley, and she goes out and gets almost all of it. Uh, she's raised literally tens of millions of dollars to support her efforts in making sure there are the school systems of Houston, starting with HISD, but also others in the surrounding area, are doing all they can in the right ways to educate the students. An increasing recognition of our faculty, particularly our young faculty, you see early career wards, new investigators, rising stars in material science, uh, Halton Wong, 30 under 30 in science recently, really an extraordinary group of young faculty who represent the future of the university. Now, um, it's really a central element to expanding access, diversity, and inclusiveness. Some of that's reflected in the Rice investment and applications. So this year we had slightly over 27,000. I was surprised a little bit to see the sort of admissions and enrollment staff here today as they <laughs> pierce through, but even more surprised to see them all smiling as they go through those 27,000 applications. I, I will say, it's not that we live for higher numbers of applications, but as I've been traveling around, I was recently in Silicon Valley uh, visiting some tech firms that we're interested in trying to bring to the city, and it does get their attention, I will say, when you tell them we have 27,000 applications for 945 places. They so tend to sit up and pay a little bit notice if they haven't uh, paid much attention to Rice for, as you can see, that growth comes from all over, but really particularly what we have is an increasingly national and international applicant pool, and therefore a student body. And we also have an increasingly diverse pool. This is actually the enrollment of our undergraduate students, representing a very substantial change in the last uh, 10, to, 10 to 14 years. But I think what's really important is that enrollment very much reflects what our applicant pool looks like. As people learn the kind of environment at Rice, and they are choosing, in effect, to be part of a diverse environment, we become one of the most uh, diverse uh, universities in the country, and certainly one of the most diverse uh, elite private universities in the country. A key part of that, as we look forward, is the Rice investment. And as I've been traveling around, the way I present this is not just the substance of the investment, which has gotten a lot of attention, but my little brag is that I think we have one of the few financial aid policies that can be explained in 45 seconds. Now, it turns out that's an exaggeration, because somebody timed me the other day, and it's 27 seconds it takes to explain our financial aid policy with really very little in what I call let's see here, the asterisks, right? This really is the only significant asterisk, which is with typical assets. So if somebody has $100,000 income because they have a million dollar trust account, they might not get the full, full benefit of the Rice investment. This had really got tremendous publicity all across the country. But most importantly, it's just the right thing to do. It reflects our history as a university and our commitment to making sure that our education is available to all regardless of their means. It really put us ahead of the curve. And one of the things we heard students and alumni really saying is how proud it made them of their university to be a leader in this regard. These are some of the reactions. Uh, I have to say, just personally, I wish we could announce something like this once a semester. Uh, I, 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 there are some cranky folks. I mean, how many, how many occasionally watch things on YouTube? I'm not asking if you watch at work. I'm just asking if you occasionally watch it. You, 
YouTube. So, so, so you know how, like, you know, you watch YouTube, it's got 100,000, you know, likes, and then there are 2,327 people who didn't like it. There were about three people who had complaints about the rice in, in investment, but the, the reaction was powerful, not just the numbers in terms of the responses, but it really struck an emotional chord with our community. And I think what we saw, you know, we already had a very aggressive program for lower income students, but what the Rice Investment did is take that up another notch to really relieve them of some of the stress and worries. Could the lower income students already afford Rice? Yes, they could. But were they worried about a lot of things with their families and getting from day to day? Yes, they were and the Rice Investment helped transform that. On the diversity front, the faculty is not as strong a success story of course, as our students have been, although in the last years, particularly with uh, the efforts of Mari Lynn Miranda and the provost's office, we have really been making much more progress in diversifying our faculty. And you can see over six years as a percentage change, that's a very substantial change. That's gonna continue to require our hard work and focus. In terms of elevating our achievement and reputation, one of the things we all, that people say we're good at is starting new things, and we're less good at is stopping the things that maybe have run their course, but that's the essence of a university. There are always, there's always new knowledge to be discovered, new programs, and our faculty and staff have been remarkably creative, new investments in data science, for example, in a range of ways, in, intersection of engineering and medicine, program to think hard about the sources of inequalities and inequities in our society and how we can best address those. A whole range of urban studies, the strength of the kin, not only of the Kinder Institute, but building new connections between architecture and engineering. That's what a university does, is create new areas of discovery and knowledge. And of course, that requires the buildings to do it in. And the architecture of these buildings is incredibly important. In order to enable, this is the advantage of getting here early and sitting in the front row. It actually changes what I say. Uh, but that architecture is to enable us to accomplish our, our mission. And we are in a new period of construction on our our campus, our ambitions across the campus continue to grow. We're making huge investments in terms of science and engineering and facilities because if we're going to aspire, or we're going to be among the great universities, we have to have the best facilities for our faculty. We're taking a very careful look at what to do with the student center here, which really no longer serves the needs of our community and particularly what our students are looking for in terms of their experience here. Take a new look at the library and what kinds of things that really should be in the li library, which you go back decades, the library was primarily just the place where books were kept and parceled out to people who needed them. Now the functions of the library in terms of the intellectual hub of the campus and what goes on there have just grown and magnified and we need to make sure the spaces serve that new vision of what a library is and what a library could be. I spoke earlier about Sidridge College, a whole range of things. Of course, you can all see the Rice University Music and Performing Arts Center, which not only will help create the very best facilities for any music school in the country, but give our students another performance venue for student theater and also probably the best single space on our campus for speakers that we bring to the campus. Extending our reach and impact through digital education. So I have, uh, this being Texas, uh, I, 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 did, I did threaten uh, to shoot somebody. Um, if, 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 if they ever said that, again, that Rice was too small for something. We are not too small for anything. And we accomplish what we do and what we aspire to do in lots of different ways. And last time we had a strategic plan, we decided that we should grow 30%. We are not planning at this point to grow our on-campus, particularly our on-campus undergraduate population. 
but we reach every year tens of thousands of students through continuing studies on our campus. And as you see, we can reach hundreds of thousands of students through our online courses. The Jones School just launched a new M online MBA program, which is going very well. And in the fall, we'll have a new online computer science degree. So those are two of the five in our strategic plan. We said we would put in at least five new online degrees. I hope that's a, a minimum of what we'll do. But our university will have an impact that extends to hundreds of thousands of people here in the Houston area. And when we talk about online degree programs, it's not just people in the, across the country or around the world. It's actually a lot of people here in Houston who can't get to the campus, who can't commute an hour and a half a day or have full-time jobs. Those are people who are well served by the online courses and programs we're developing. And then in terms of Houston, our plank when we did the V2C was to engage with the city of Houston and this time is engage and empower the city of Houston. And I can tell you sitting in meetings and again going with the mayor and the Greater Houston Partnership out to Silicon Valley, folks are looking at Rice in a new light and I would say particularly because of the innovation district. Or as I put it, only Rice could come up with the land, the vision, and the $100 million investment managed by our endowment to make this innovation hub a reality. Construction will start begin in just a couple months, and it should be completed by the end of next year as the focal point for innovation in the city of Houston. But there are so many other ways. For those of you who have gone to Rice Village, you've seen it become a more dynamic place, also managed by the Rice Management Company. After Hurricane Harvey and had a lot of destruction in Meyerland and other places, Rice became the place to construct the Houston Jewish Archive, the Texas Policy Lab, a resource for the state and also the city and others. Um, uh, D2K, the data to knowledge effort under Ginevra Allen to serve institutions, both those of us within Rice, but also nonprofit institutions and others around the city enabling them to use their data to better end. So that's just a snapshot of where our university is, really aimed once more at achieving excellence, opportunity, and impact. And I want to just conclude, I think we have some time for questions, by thanking all of you again. None of this is possible without what you contribute to this university, our city, our country, and our world every single day. Thank you all very, very much.